lifetime I'm back there getting something to do the music. Not paying any attention to the timer. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Surprise, it's time to start. <laughs> Oh, what a beautiful day. Thank you all for being here this morning. Those of you that are on live, give us a shout out. Let us know that you're here by saying hi in the comments. So, this Wednesday, this is a busy, well, this is a holiday week. This is Labor Day weekend. Can you believe it already? September? What? Mm -hmm. Year is now well past halfway over. Mm -hmm. Now, join us this Wednesday night as we continue season two of the Chosen Study series. And uh, this is a yeah, I know Mark will talk a little more about the episode this morning, so I'm not going to say anything more about it. But mm -hmm. we like to watch them in like succession. We missed a week because of the heat index, so we we binge watched two episodes this last uh, Wednesday night, and everybody's like, "Watch one more, watch one more." <laughs> so they are really good. So please join us for that and for the discussion and then prayer after that. Then this Saturday we have our next. Uh, race of the orange track racing season season 18 is winding down with the final three months of racing so we will uh, points are kind of tight in some of the classes and one or two of the classes i think there's a blowout going on but those that's to be expected and then we'll take a little break for a few weeks on the weekends or on saturdays anyway and we'll come back on october 7th with our next men's breakfast um, you're missing out if you're not showing up. Great discussion, great fellowship with men, the other men in the group, uh, you're connecting. But the food, there's been, we've been doing breakfast sandwiches with either pancakes or biscuits, English muffins. We've had, again, pancakes by themselves, fried eggs, sausage. Did anybody go home hungry yesterday? Did you forget something? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Just maybe I left that out just for oh, you, Denny. Yeah. No, because Denny forgot his biscuits and gravy leftovers yesterday. Did you eat them all this morning? Not all. They're all gone? No. All gone. Half, half. half of it? Okay. <laughs> yes, and we do have biscuits and gravy. So please join us next month on the 7th for that. And as soon as we finish getting done eating and discussing, we are going to transform the restaurant into a movie theater. And uh, Grace Street Cinema will be showing the next uh, installment of the Chronicles of Narnia series, Prince Caspian. And if you've noticed, <coughs> if you're paying attention, we aren't doing these every other month. We're just going to do a three month run. Boom, get them done. Sat or so, so September, October, and then in November, we'll have Voyage of the Don Treader. So uh, you'll want to join us for each one of those. If you want to know more, watch the trailer, what have you, go out to Grace Street Church, click on Grace Street Cinema in the upper right hand corner. I talk with my hands, I point, even though you might not be able to see what I'm pointing at. And therefore, you can uh, watch the trailer and read a little bit more. Then for those of you that are watching online, the link is going up in the feed for the worship music. If for some reason the feed stops early or you don't get it clicked right away, Go ahead and go out to our Facebook page. It's already posted up there so that you can get at it after the fact. Um, we don't want anybody missing out on the wonderful music for this morning. Well, that all gets us to the point where we, for the reason we really came here, because we did not come to hear me talk about a bunch of announcements. We came to hear God. We came to hear God through the message this morning. And in our call to worship this morning, uh, the passage that has been chosen from, by Pastor Mark is Isaiah 41.10. And this is from the English Standard Version. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, what we need to understand is this chapter we're starting now in the part of the book of isaiah where isaiah is starting to speak to the israelites who will be the future babylonian exiles not the current not, it's not a current thing he's prophesying into the future and they're going to be able to see these prophecies come true but 
and he, what he's doing here is he is encouraging the Israelites that as soon as they get there to flee, run back to the promised land. Get back there as fast as you can. And this should be an encouragement to each and every one of us, especially as we look around and see the state of our world today. We could almost say like we are, well, we truly are exiles in this world. This is not our home. <coughs> so that's something that we need to be aware of. And we don't need to fear. And there's three points to read why we don't need to fear. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let Mark do that here just a little bit. Well, maybe one. God's with us. But Mark's got the rest of these. And and we need to really uh, listen to those because he is with us. He is our God and he does give us assurances. And are you aware? Think about this. As you listen to Mark's message this morning, the message that Mark gave God this morning, are you aware of all the things that God has done to help you? When you think about where you've been and where you are now, Mark's going to talk a little bit more about maybe where we need to be. Mark's got a challenge for you today. And I'm looking forward to hearing this challenge. And it may feel uncomfortable. You know that, I don't know about y'all, when I get uncomfortable, my temperature, my body temperature <laughs> rises up. Doesn't matter how cold the room is, I could be in a freezer and I'm going to be sweating when I get challenged sometimes. And I'm looking forward to getting to that feeling today. I'm looking forward to being challenged by the message today because God wants to help show us the way he wants to use his word the Bible and he places people in each of our paths think about that think about the people that God has put in your path and look at what he did as he guided the Israelites through the desert more about that again Pastor Mark in just a little bit I may have just snuck a peek at the sermon because God He's established his order here on earth using his power. And we have choices. Mark's going to challenge us and ask us if we're choosing the right ones. We saw that in the movie last night with in Nar the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Robe <coughs> wardrobe with Ed. His choices at the beginning were not the best. So we all need to listen this morning extremely carefully as Pastor Mark teaches us and helps us so that we can stop wondering physically and spiritually. God, open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear the message that you have given to Mark today. Father, all too often it's so easy for us to wonder about. You know, I, I think about a movie that, that I saw years and years and years ago that's called A Walkabout. And, and we tend to do that. We tend to wonder. Our minds maybe physically, mentally, or spiritually, we wonder, and oftentimes we can be right in the middle of studying your word, Father, and our minds wander away. Father, help us to stay focused on you. Help us to not wonder physically or spiritually. Father, we thank you for the message that you've given to Mark this morning, and we look forward to the challenge that he is about to place on us. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Are we ready to, you know, stand up and shout and jump? And yeah, not so much. Huh? <laughs> well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, and I chose that passage in Isaiah this morning because it's a great reminder and of what God is doing for us all the time. So if you wouldn't mind, can you pop that call to worship back up on the screen? I'll give her a second here. One more. Oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong side. There we go. So it says, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So Believe it or not, there's a lot going on in that message. And 
when we think about wandering, and we're talking about wandering physically and spiritually, we go back to the Israelites, and they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness in their exodus from Egypt. See, God caused them to wander because they rebelled against God. But it's important to know that even though he caused them to wander, he confused them so they, they didn't really know where to go. But he put a pillar up in front of them by day and by night. So they knew what to follow. And then what else did he do? He gave them manna, provided breakfast every morning. Breakfast in bed, <coughs> breakfast in the desert, breakfast wherever they were. And then he fed them with quail. So he sustained them. He says, I will help you, I will strengthen you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Even though the people kept disobedience, their disobedience up to God. They kept rebelling against him, and they kept turning back to the old ways and to the pagan idols and everything else, even though they were rebelling against God, God still provided for them. They were wandering. They were lost. They were lost spiritually. They were wandering physically. And it's important to note that he provided them with food and guidance, so they weren't lost so much physically, and there's some that would equate that wandering with being lost, but it's not always so. And I have this t-shirt that I wrote, I think I wrote that last week, uh, that says, not all who wander are lost. And it's based on Luke 15, 10. And that says, just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of heaven over one sinner who repents. When that sinner repents and returns to God, then he's no longer lost. So that sinner, when they when he repents and turns around and comes back to God, guess what? He's no longer lost. He's not spiritually lost. He's found. So this chapter in Luke talks about three parables. We have the parable of the lost sheep. Everybody know that one? Yeah, okay. The lost coin and the lost son, sometimes called the prodigal son. Now, to understand the three stories, see, they're very different in substance because they were talking about three different items in a person's life. But all three have a common thing. All three stories have in them a clear and present message. Every story is based on the one. The one. The first one is that one sheep out of a hundred that is lost. And the shepherd leaves the other sheep to go find that lost sheep and bring it back into the fold. And the second one is one coin out of ten. And the third one is one son. Although the second son clearly ties into the meaning of the story that is told there, that parable, every story is the one is first lost and then found. Wandering. Lost. And in every story, there's an exuberant joy and a celebration when that one is found. God graciously seeks and saves the lost. Isn't that awesome? He seeks to find us when we are lost. He doesn't depend on us finding him when we're lost. He seeks us. And he puts these little reminders in our path. What makes heaven happy when one who is lost is found? See, that's what that verse was talking about. That's what causes heaven, the angels in heaven to rejoice, is that one being found turning back to God. He wants everybody to be returned to him. Everyone. No matter what they've done, no matter where they've gone, no matter how far they've wandered, he wants those to return. See, we were all once lost, but now we're found. And there are really two key ways to wonder and to be lost, and that is what I said, physically and spiritually. Now, when we take a look at this objectively, we might be both at once. We might be physically lost and spiritually lost at the same time. Now, we can equate that then to the Jews coming out of Egypt. 
because they were physically lost and at the same time they were spiritually lost because of the fact that they rejected God and the teachings about God. And if we equate that to our own lives, the same may be true for us. And that is, the same lost and wandering could be us at any certain time in our lives as well. So in this episode of The Chosen that we're looking at in here, Jesus tells his disciples, everyone has wandered through the wilderness at some point. So what did he mean by that? Everyone has wandered through the wilderness at some point. What wilderness, then, have you gone through in your lives? Have you ever thought about that? You ever thought about yourself being lost? Mm -hmm. I can identify with that. I <coughs> wandered off path many times. Many times. And I can tell you that God will seek you out. He will find you when he has his time and his purpose for you. And boy, he gets your attention when he does. So when we hear that term wilderness, what, what image pops into your head? That's like one of those onomatopoeia things. What, you know, it sounds like what it is, right? When we think of wilderness, we think of an area that's unsettled, an uncultivated region, especially when we think about being lost. It might be a barren and a desolate place to be. Or it could be used to describe our mental state when we have settled in our mind our life situation. Some of us in this room have visited this place in our lives. And it's not a place that you really want to have and be in for very long. That unsettledness in your spirit, that unsettledness in your mind, that desolate area, that wasteland. And when we realize that our lives are lost, we had choices to make. And understand that only the only one who can make choices for your life is you. You can't depend on anybody else to make those choices. When we go to make those choices, we need to understand that, that the environment has an effect on the choices we make. And that means our physical environment, the people we associate with, the lifestyle, those things will affect the choices that we make in our life. And so there's three very important ideas that I want you to hold on to. And I want you to ask yourself these questions today. You don't have to answer out loud, but I think they're very, very important. Number one, do I like where I am in my life at this point in time? Have I made the right choices to get me to where I really want to be with my life? Do I love the life that I'm in? Are the circle of friends and or acquaintances that I have moving me towards where God wants me to be or keeping me from it? That's a very important question to ask. And then number three is the most important. What am I willing to do about it? What am I willing to do? Are you willing to stay stuck where you're at in that wasteland? Or are you willing to make the changes necessary, commit to them to change your life? See, if you're not willing to make a change, you're destined to stay where you are. If you're not willing to make a change, then you're destined to stay where you are. So let's look at this closer, and you can see this is nothing new. So in, in the episode that we have of The Chosen, we find ourselves in John 5, where Jesus heals the lame man. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the many Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the Pool of Bethsaida. And it's covered with five porches. And on those five porches, there were crowds of sick people. They were blind and lame and paralyzed, laying on the porches. And one of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? And so the man answered. He says, well, I can't, sir, the sixth man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. And Jesus told him, stand up and pick up your mat and walk. And instantly the man was healed. <coughs> he rolled up his sleeping mat and began to walk. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees that were in attendance, they objected to it. And they said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to keep 
to carry that sleeping mat. So here we see Jesse at the pool of Bethesda. The pool is a pagan idol. So you have to understand what that's about and the whole picture of what's going on in John 5 there. And it has the belief that the first one to get to the healing waters when they boil up in the middle of the pool, they will be healed, but none of the rest will. Now, Jesse had been crippled for 38 years, according to that scripture. He was raised in a Jewish household. He knew the promises of God. But see, Jesse got spiritually lost. In the midst of his crippled state, he, he lost hope that he would get healed. He lost spiritually his love of God and that God could heal him in his present place. He lost hope in his family. He lost God in the process of his life being crippled. And so he put his faith and trust and everything but God. And he lay crippled for 38 years. 38 years, can you imagine? When Jesus came to him and asked if he wanted to be healed, he told Jesus why he couldn't be healed. Instead of saying, yes, I want to be healed, he said, see, that's, that's a person who's given up. They're in a wasteland. They're desolate in their lives. They've succumbed to their circumstance. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? You would think that the first thing that person would want to do would be to step up and say, yes, yes, I want to be healed. But he didn't. He didn't. He told Jesus why he couldn't be healed. But once he said yes to Jesus, then he was healed instantly. So he was no longer bound to be lost, spiritually or physically. But he had to step up and say yes to God in Jesus. And in doing so, he was freed from that existence that he was simply living out day to day. He was going through the motions of life, but he was not living life. And that is the same time that we might find ourselves today lost in our own way, kind of just sunk into a life cycle and, and, and this lifestyle and we just give up on God. We give up on the life that God had planned for us. But the good news is we don't have to stay lost. We just need to take that first step. We don't have to stay in our circumstance. We don't have to stay in that situation. But we need to take that first step. We need to make the choice to say yes to Jesus and then follow him. Now what I mean by that is we need to take a, that step up and step out of that mindset that we have and make positive changes in our lives. We have to take that first step. You know how important that first step is? You can't get anywhere unless you take that first step. Otherwise, you're stuck in place and you never move. We've been given an opportunity to make a change in our life and we need to seize that opportunity and start living life anew. So how do we do that? Well, that's simply by heeding God's call. And God puts people in our lives to help us make good life decisions. And we're here to help you do that as the church. As God's people, we can pull together our resources and we can help you change. But the first step is yours. The first step is yours. The first choice is yours to make. And to that I say, welcome home. Welcome home. So you've taken that first step from being lost physically and spiritually, and you've taken that first step towards the rest of your life. Welcome home. Another example of being lost is one we don't hear or see very often in our world today, but it's being spiritually possessed. Now in The Chosen, we have seen Mary Magdalene, who is possessed by an evil spirit, lost in a big way. She had fallen into a very dark place in her life. But see, once she encountered the living God in Jesus, she was delivered from that possession and joined in spreading the good news of the gospel. You talk about a transformation. You talk about a life change. But she had to take that step. 
she had to say yes to Jesus. Her life had been hijacked, if you will. She was an outcast, unclean, and yet she became chosen to do God's work, and her life was never the same. We'll see other examples as time goes by. I'm fairly certain of that. But see, despite her circumstance, despite being lost in a lost world, she was found and returned to do good works. That's very important for you to understand. The whole meaning of that whole story is that exact thing. She was lost in a lost world, but she was found and returned to do good works. God followed her, pursued her, and returned her. Mary became then a living example of God of Jesus' redemptive power and to prove, prove, boy, prove his identity as the Son of God. I think I need more coffee or something. <laughs> so I have a question for you today. Do you know anyone who is spiritually lost? I think if we really think about it, most of us do. I know <coughs> many who are lost and don't even realize it. There are those who I've observed over the years that attend church services regularly and do not have a relationship with God. And see, those people are lost. Those people are lost. We have to understand that. They come to church on a Saturday and Sunday, and once they leave the church, they behave as though they have no place with God or the church. They're simply going through the motions. Pew warmers is what I call. But see, they don't really know God. They don't have that relationship. And I've used this illustration many times before. Parking yourself in a church no more makes you a Christian than sitting in the garage makes you a car. It's kind of goofy, but it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Parking yourself in a church no more than makes you a Christian than sitting in a garage makes you a car. There are many who know of God, but don't really take the time to really know God. And see, they are spiritually lost. So Jesus goes on and when he's talking to, the, to Nicodemus, and he says, Unless you were born again of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And see, Jesus told Nicodemus as he was telling him that he was going through the motions on a daily basis, but he didn't know God. Can you imagine that? See, the Pharisees were so busy focusing on the law and anyone that, who would dare step outside of those lines that they had drawn, they completely missed the reason for the law in the first place. And the reason that they had the law was to keep people in due bounds and to maintain a relationship with God. That's what those laws were put into place for. They worshiped the law and not God. And see, they got lost in the process. They got lost in the process. And this is where the apostle Paul was in his life. He was Saul at the time. He was a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin. He was like Nicodemus. He was a rabbinical scholar. And he was totally focused on the law and not on God. See, he was spiritually lost at the time. He didn't even know it. He was persecuting Christians to the point of having them imprisoned or worse, ending up in death. But an encounter with the risen Christ and he was changed forever. He became Paul, the most ardent supporter of Jesus Christ and and dedicating himself to proclaiming the good news of Jesus to a broken world in word and in deed. He made the choice to change, and his life was forever changed. You're never too far gone. You're never too far lost for God to pursue you and to bring you back. See, you need to remember when, when Saul was on the road to, to uh, Damascus, and what happens? He, he was on the way to have some more Christians arrested, right? He had a mission. He had all the paperwork. People were outside. They broke the law. So he was going to go and persecute them for breaking the law. And then he 
he hears this voice. And he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he had, he had something like scales put over his eyes for three days. And then Ananias was sent to remove the scales. And Saul was transformed into Paul. See, he was given a second chance at life. And look what he did with it. How many people had been lost from a church and lost from God because of a self-righteous person or persons who used their Bibles or their positions as a weapon and drove the people away from God in the process? I can't tell you how many people I've seen this happen to. I can't tell you. These can be then the hardest people to reach and bring back into the fold, to bring back to God. See, I know it firsthand because I have family that are in that group. It's heartbreaking to see and you feel helpless to bring back your own family into that group. Bring them back to God. We can pray, we can plant seeds, but only God can make those seeds grow and harvest and bring them back into the fold in his time. Only God can do that. So we pray that God will soften their hearts and that they will come back home. In our troubled times, you hear a lot about the end times coming that appears and we're coming closer and closer to that now in our lifetime. And it may come to pass soon. It may. And this is why it's so important for us to fulfill the Great Commission to reach out to those who are lost and bring them back home. That is the main reason for the chosen. See, it's an outreach. Many who may have turned away or lost are inspired to come back to Jesus, to find their way again. And for some, it may be the first glimpse into what God can do for them in their lives. And it's never too late for anyone to come or return as long as they do it before they can't. Then it's too late. So we need to realize right here, right now, in these, that they are an all opportunity to put our faith into action, to step up and step out of our comfort zone and find the lost, find the struggling, to find the rejected and give them a hand up on their way. Reminder, reminder, big flashing light, if you will. It's only our job to plant the seeds. God will handle the rest. He's only asking us to go out and talk to the people and remind them that he is there each and every day for them. God will handle the rest. So today I'd like to challenge each and every one here, whether you're in person or online, to contact five people this week and invite them to come to church, to come to a men's group, to come to Wednesday night studies, to come to movie night. And you go, oh, I'm just kind of too busy. Too busy. Well, there's 10,080 minutes in a week, and it would only take... 30 of those minutes to ask five people to invite them, to plant that seed, to bring them back to God. The worst they can do is say no, but if they say yes, it could mean a lifetime of grace and love that they don't have now. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Today, God, we come before you and we surrender our lives to you. We trust you, Lord. We want to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit today to bring us back in unison. Let this prayer in unison, in one spirit, bring us back into your presence today, Lord. Father, thank you that you depend on us and that we depend on you. We ask, Lord, that you would empower our lives with the Holy Spirit to help us step up and step out for the life of another person, to bring them back to you. Help me to trust in you fully and to let your, your Holy Spirit guide my life and guide my heart. Bring your Holy Spirit to us today, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love and send forth your Spirit and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. 
Lord, by that light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. And in that same spirit, help us to delight in what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our living God and our Lord. This morning before church, Mark and I noticed a vehicle that would park and back up and drive around the parking lot, park somewhere else. And it just, it just, <coughs> like it was a perfect an example of what Mark was talking about today, just looking all these different places when there's only one place we need to look. That's to God and his word. And so each week, <laughs> Sorry. If you weren't awake, you are now. But that's important because we need to hear God's message. We need to hear God's message. I'm going to stay right here. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, and this is, it's, this is Labor Day weekend, a weekend where we, we pray for those who need work, those who are working, and for all how we all work together as one in the body of Christ. So on the night that he is betrayed, before they had the meal, Jesus took off his robe, put on a, what we would consider an apron, grabbed a vessel of water, and washed the disciples' feet. He served. Think about that as we take communion today. So on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. A foreshadow of what he's about to do for us and serving us. He took the cup and he blessed it. So this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. Scriptures tell us that each time that we take eat of this bread and drink of this cup, that we are to do so until Christ returns. The body of Christ is broken for you. Take. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Gracious Lord, we thank you for what this meal represents and that we can come before you each and every time that we gather and share in this meal. It's representative of the fact that no matter what we have been through in our lives, that you have wiped that slate clean. All too often those people in our lives tend to want to dr drudge that stuff back up, but you've already dealt with it. Just as we saw in the movie last night, when Aslan looked at Lucy and Susan and Peter and said, what's done is done. There's no more need to discuss it concerning everything. Father, let us look forward. Let us take this message that we've heard today so that we no longer are wondering about aimlessly, physically, or spiritually. But you've put in our paths people who will guide us, direct us, walk alongside us. And Father, may we be that person for others. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> well, those of you that are watching online can't see the fact that Denise is not here, so you don't get to listen to her today. She, I always love listening to Denise pray. She has a gift. But that said, um, I have some things that I know we do need to pray for. Uh, I'm talking with Monica on the way here to church this morning. Um, her son is battling addiction. Grandson is in juvenile detention. Still don't know the outcome for that. Uh, Becky, we know that your daughter is struggling with addiction as well, and we pray for her. Are there any other prayers that we would like to lift up today?
Heavenly Father, we come before you right now and we lift these people up, Father. We lift them up, whether they're battling an addiction, whether they have done something that has caused them to have to deal with the consequences of their actions, whether they are dealing with the healing from surgeries, whether surgery is upcoming, whether they're dealing with a disease that is affecting their bodies, whether that's their ability to walk or to talk or to hear or to see, or just in general to move, to breathe. Father, you are the great physician and we look to you giving these people to you and into your care, knowing that by our hands, we can do nothing apart from you. Thank you for the doctors and nurses and the caregivers that you have put in our families' lives. Father, I also want to pray this morning for Harold, that he gets the care that he needs in the center, the care center that he's in, that he would have that quality of life that he deserves. Father, we thank you that you put us together as a body of believers, the hands and feet of your kingdom. We pray for all of those who work together, whether it's in the church or in our homes, at our jobs. We thank you for all the people that come together and make this world work as one, whether they believe in you yet or not. Father, I say yet because of pray that at some point someone will come into their lives and show them the hope that we have. We pray for health and joy and hope and love, Father. Grant us wisdom to deal with our daily grind, the things that we come across each day, whether that's at home or at work. Help us to make good decisions, Father. Help us to not wander about physically or spiritually. Help us to focus on you. <clears throat> Father, we know that at some point our time will come to join you in your kingdom as we are just exiles here in this world. We look forward to that day, but until that day, Father, give us the strength to go out show others you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So before we close out the online portion of our service this morning, uh, I'd invite you to go back on the table. There's a lot of really neat resources. So for the men's group, each month, um, I put together a devotion. And this one happened to be the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and it talks about GPS systems. <coughs> and the Holy Spirit is our God positioning system, if you will, for our lives. He puts the Holy Spirit in there to help guide and direct our hearts and our minds when we're lost to bring back home. He puts people in our in our paths to bring us back to Him. I want you to remember that today. If you haven't had an opportunity for, for you women who are in here and you didn't get to come to the men's group, uh, feel free to go back and grab one of those at any time. So there's several months worth back there. And it's it's a good way to help you understand God's calling back into our lives. And so we just praise you and thank you all for being here today, for bringing God's word out <coughs> into the world and uh, in your deeds and actions. So let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord God, we come before you today. We confess that we are sinners and we are in need of your grace and mercy. We repent of our sins today and we call upon you and pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus that we would be redeemed, that we would be made whole again in you. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior today and we thank you for that blessed assurance that you give us that we will be with you in heaven and that your spirit gives us the strength, the hope, and the love to be your disciples in this lost world that we're in. 
Lord, we lift up our lives to you today. We lift up our church, our city, our state, and our nation to you. And we ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in the world today. That your word and your name would be boldly proclaimed and that your works would be done. Embolden us today to step up and step out. To bring home the loss and lead us to growth in your spirit and to keep us unto you. In your precious name we pray today. Mm-hmm. <laughs>